So I'm, I'm one of the few guys who, who don't really have a picture myself, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we'll have to fix that until next time, but... <coughs> yeah. <coughs> so, um, uh, I think Prime Key Tech Days is now officially the only conference I'm not banned from, so I hope I will be able to attend next year. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Bastian Fredriksen, as, as Admir said. Um, I work as a solution consultant, um, but currently I'm doing some EGBCA development, and I wrote my thesis on blockchains. Um, did it stop working now? It's, it's still working, yeah. Uh, I wrote my thesis this spring on blockchains, and that was well, at Prime Key. Um, so I thought that would you know, be a good, good um, topic for this talk. So I have divided my talk into two parts. So the first part, I would just try to you know, explain to you why blockchains can be interesting for people that work with public key infrastructures. Um, and I will go through some possible use cases. And in the second part, I will explain very briefly about my thesis and what I've done. OK, so let's get started. Why should we care about blockchains? Um, the, Blockchains has been, you know, the big buzzword for the past, say, two years, and everyone tries to use them for something, and some of those use cases are like real use cases. Some of them are just made up. Um, so yeah, I think there are some interesting things. Um, one of them is that you know, a blockchain is essentially a distributed ledger. You know, maintained by a network of computers. And what you can do is you can store data on that blockchain, right? hashes of stuff. And the way the blockchain is designed, typically, <clears throat> is that once you have added something to the blockchain, it's very hard to remove it. This means that you get tamper-proof data storage, and that's very, very useful um, in the security industry, right? You want stuff like logs. You, know, you don't want people to change those. If they change the logs, you want to know that, <coughs> right? Um, so you have things like you can prove that a certain thing existed at a certain point in time. That's proof of existence. And you also get a consensus about what the world looks like, right? Which owner uses which public key, for example. Um, and you get history of past events, and it's really important if you have a dispute. Right? There's no accountability unless you, you have a history of, of things that have happened. Um, there's also one thing called smart contracts. So I'll explain that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, there is a thing called Ethereum, which is the second biggest blockchain in terms of market size that powers uh, these, these uh, smart contracts. And I also want to emphasize that and I think this is a usable thing in, in you know, many scenarios where you have things that are distributed. So even if there is a system failing over there, even if you know, there is a bug in the system over there, that you have a certain redundancy built into this. Um, and usually you have that if, if you're running you know, some kind of blockchain system. And you can do cool things like escrow operations and, and uh, similar things. Okay, so the first use case is, um, and this is a paper um, which is actually published in a real journal, so it's just not something I made up. You can check this. Uh, it's, it's called Turning a PKI Around with Blockchains, and what they do is that they create a bounty program where you can actually get paid if you find a fraudulent certificate. So I don't know how it is today. If I find a fraudulent certificate, can I get a bounty? I know we have some guys from certificate authorities in the audience. No bounty, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry? Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I can get a bounty, that's excellent. Uh, so what they do is uh, they create a um, reaction policy. The CA creates a reaction policy. And the reaction policy says that if I sign a fraudulent certificate, then I will pay the person who found that certificate this amount of money, and the victim will get paid this amount of money, right? Um, and then the domain owner creates a domain 
um, certificate policy. And the domain certificate policy is like a CAA record. So it basically says that only this certificate authority and this certificate authority is allowed to issue for my domain. Um, and then someone who monitors the certificate transparency logs, they uh, send a certificate as input to this smart contract. And the smart contract, execution of the smart contract, or say correct execution of the smart contract is guaranteed by the fact that it's run by all computers connected to this Ethereum blockchain. So you can't just you know, make anything in this contract. It has to, yeah, it's, it's executing correctly, hopefully. Um, and what it does is that it takes the certificate given as input, and it tries to match that against the domain certificate policy. And if it matches, there will be uh, a re uh, the corresponding reaction policy for the CA will get executed, and money will automatically be transferred from the CA to the victim and the detector. Um, so this is uh, a way of uh, automizing the process of paying people money for monitoring the certificate transparency logs. <clears throat> so it's an interesting application of, of these so-called smart contracts. Okay, uh, another use case is notary services. And a notary service is, for example, a CA, which issues a certificate which proves ownership of some kind of asset, right? Um, and this asset can then be traded on a blockchain. And a seller and a buyer can then come together and they can agree on a price and they can perform the, the transaction uh, of money uh, or this asset, this certificate, without anyone else being involved. That's what I call an escrow operation without a trusted intermediary. Um, there's actually this, this Swedish uh, government agency called Lantmäteriet, which has been looking at how you can put real estate in Sweden on a blockchain. And before you think, like, these guys are crazy, right? Um, and there are actually countries like Georgia uh, that are already doing this. I don't know if uh, it's, it's, uh, they're doing it sh you know, in production, but I know they have um, been doing attempts um, with this. Another thing I think everyone running a CA is interested in is secure logging. So what you can do is that you know, every, say, 10 minutes, you can hash your log, and you can send that hash in a blockchain transaction and put it on the blockchain, right? And if someone changes your log, right, an attacker changes your log and you know, removes some log entry somewhere, um, then you will detect that because the hash of your log, your local log, will no longer match the hash stored on the blockchain. And that's a really great tool um, that can be used internally or it can be used for uh, auditors to detect problems. Um, you can also build you know, public key infrastructures completely without uh, certificate authorities. Um, and like, of course, certificate authorities, they, they do stuff, right? So, so these, these decentralized public key infrastructures, they might not always be applicable. But you can build them, right? There is uh, a system called Namecoin, which is a fork of the Bitcoin software uh, that's been a long, you know, around for many years now. And they govern a, a dot .bit top domain where you can register your, your dot .bit domain completely independent from ICANN. And then you can uh, also connect your public key to this domain. Um, so my thesis was about uh, building a decentralized public key infrastructure with certificate authorities and you know, give an example of how you can do that. Um, so I, will, you know, I know you came all this way for definitions. So, <laughs> um, so one thing uh, very simple, like you have a state, right? A state is simply all the information you have in a system. Um, 
And then you have a transaction. And what I mean by transaction is that it's an operation which is carried out on that state. Right? And then we can define a state transition function which just takes an operation and a state, applies the, uh, the operation on the state, and outputs a new state. Right? Very basic. Uh, a block is then consisting of two parts. There's a block header which contains a reference to the previous block, and usually something like a timestamp, and a list of transactions. And a blockchain is then simply a list of blocks, right? And it's important here to realize that the order of the blocks, uh, or the order of the block, uh, blocks, uh, they, it is enforced by the fact that you, you include a cryptographic hash the previous block header into the current block, right? So you can't just swap these, these guys around. The, the order is, is important there. <clears throat> uh, block leader is simply the guy who created the last block. And we can define a blockchain consensus algorithm. And this is my own definition. So if you don't like it, you can define it another way, maybe. Um, so you have a choose function, which given a set of competing blockchains outputs the, say, correct chain, right? The chain that you should uh, continue to, to use. And there is an elect function which tells you who the next person to extend the chain is. Right? And consensus algorithms is, is nothing new. You have, ha you have them in distributed databases, uh, for example, to ma make sure that all the copies of the database are kept in sync. <clears throat> okay, so based on these definitions, we can create a distributed public key infrastructure. Um, and the state is essentially a mapping between names and public keys. So I'm a stupid person, so I, I, I like to like make things simple. So I think of a, of a public key infrastructure as a mapping between names and public keys. The rest is just fluff, right? Uh, and a transaction is, say, add, delete, or update key, right? Uh, and block leader is a CA, right? It's not a miner. If you use Bitcoin, you might have heard of miners. You know, like people do like heavy calculation stuff. This is just a CA, and a CA signs the block together with a couple of other CAs to ensure that everything is in the block is correct. And the consensus algorithm is that you choose the blockchain with the most blocks. That's the correct blockchain. That's the truth. Everything else is, is, is wrong, right? And then you can take the hash of all the block headers in your blockchain. That gives like a pseudo-random number. And you can use that pseudo-random number to select the next CA allowed to generate the next block. <clears throat> um, okay, so what you would want to do maybe is add a new credential. So what you can do is I generate my public key. I put it in a certificate signing request. I send it to a CA. The CA ensures somehow that this key belongs to me and signs that key with their private key. And then they send it to the blockchain as a blockchain transaction. Now, to update an existing credential, um, I need to sign my new key with the old one. Um, so it's it's kind of a key rollover where you you know you need to attest a new key with the old key. So you always have a chain of valid signatures to go after. And this is important to ensure that you cannot steal someone else's identity. And this has nothing to do with blockchains, really. You could do this with, you know, in any other system as well. Um, so the new key and the signature produced, uh, you know, by the old key is sent to a certificate authority, as usual. The certificate authority ensures that the signature is correct and that the new key belongs to me and signs that thing and creates a new blockchain transaction and an update transaction which is sent to the blockchain and processed. And to issue a certificate, 
you do as usual, except that you can now include a signature produced by the end entity with their public key stored on the blockchain. So the blockchain is like a big key store, but it's not a key store with you know, CA keys. It's a key store with end entity keys. <clears throat> and so why, why do we want to do this, right? I think the big thing here is that it's very hard to make a misissuance to create a fraudulent certificate because every certificate needs to be attested by both to by both the the end entity and the certificate authority. Um, since you have a blockchain, every transaction made is transparent, right? It's public. Everyone can see what's going on. It's it's like certificate transparency. So if something fishy is going on, someone will hopefully detect it. And you might also be able to do easier revocation of certificates, because now I can just change my own public key on the blockchain, and that will invalidate all my certificates. So that's the, like, the idea um, I, or the advantages that I can see with this scheme. Um, some pitfalls. OK, I lose my private key. What do I do? I can't, I can't update my key, right? I can't sign the, the new key with my old key because I, I lose it. Um, there might be, and that, that's the, the problem with um, basically PKI in general, that you need to keep some kind of secret safe. If you lose the private key, you're usually in trouble, like some other people pointed out. Um, so, but I mean, there are good um, solutions to this. It's built in uh, key recovery in EGBCA you can use. You can use Shamir secret sharing to split your key and distribute it to many people. You can take backups. If you have a big organization, or let's say not a small organization, but you know, um, a company should be able to keep track of their key somehow. Um, and you can build in mechanisms where you say that, say, 10 out of 20 CAs or 2 out of 100 CAs must go together and approve of this new key in order for me to change my key without me having the old key. Um, also, there are some scalability problems. So Bitcoin, which is, I think, the most um, popular system built on a blockchain today, can process about two to three transactions per second, and that's not much. Uh, the maximum is about seven transactions per second, and if you want to have a distributed public key infrastructure that everyone in the world uses, then you will run into problems. So one thing you could do is you could say, well, let's just run this on a small scale. Let's do this for people that have extended validation certificates, for example. Um, there's also a problem that the blockchain becomes quite large because you really save every transaction um, from the past. So you can solve this maybe by dropping old blocks. Say if the, the block is older than one year, you can drop it. And then you can make old um, public keys expire after a while. That's what I did in my thesis. Um, and one thing you, you can ask yourself, OK, isn't it very expensive? to validate the certificate now, because I need to download the whole blockchain? Um, the answer is no, you don't. At least you can do it uh, smarter um, under some security assumptions. Um, and it's important to realize also that somehow you need to do checks in, in the client to make sure that the signature of the end entity is correct. The CAs could do this check, right? But in the end, you need to do those checks yourself locally on your computer in your client, your web browser, whatever, in order to make sure that the certificate is correct. <clears throat> so you can do this with an accumulator. An accumulator um, is, is a cryptographic primitive which allows you to represent a large set of elements with a single short value. Before you think like, no, oh, that's theoretically information impossible. Like, how can you do that? Let me explain how it works. So 
um, you can describe an accumulator with four polynomial time algorithms. The first one is a generate function, which takes a security parameter, k, and outputs an empty accumulator. The second one is an add function that takes a value to add to the accumulator and uh, an accumulator, and it adds the value to the accumulator and outputs a new uh, accumulator and a witness value, which proves that v here was added to this accumulator. Um, and there is a witness update method, so every time you add new stuff to the accumulator, you might also need to update some of the witnesses. And there's a verify method that takes an accumulator, a value, and a witness, and outputs true if and only if this value was added to the accumulator according to this witness. Right, so this is what it might look like. Um, you have a generate method, you generate an empty accumulator, <coughs> and you add some blue value to this uh, empty accumulator using the add method, and it outputs a witness and an updated accumulator. Right. <coughs> okay, so how can you do verification of certificates using this accumulator and the, the blockchain that we described earlier? So, yeah, so we, every time we apply this state transition function, that is, every time we update the state of the blockchain by processing a transaction, we also need to update the accumulator and the appropriate witnesses. Then you put the accumulator that you have in the block, right? That you block on the blockchain. Um, a web browser, for example, can be something else, can be you know, your Java TLS client, um, will then act as a thin client. And a thin client is simply a blockchain client which only downloads the block headers and validates the block headers. Right, it doesn't validate the transactions, so it's it's um, uh, relying on the entities in this case, the certificate authorities, to not approve fraudulent uh, transactions. Right, and what you do is that you validate the block headers um, of the blockchain with the most blocks advertised by the network. You extract the accumulator from the last block, <coughs> and you extract the common name from the certificate, say, and then you take the public key and the witness, which can be, for example, stapled in a custom OCSP extension, so it can be sent together with a certificate, um, and you run the verify method with these guys as input. And if the verify method says, yeah, this, this um, uh, common name and this uh, public key was added to accumulator, it means that uh, the guy in the certificate actually has this public end entity public key, then we can use that public key to verify the end entity signature, which is, which is in a custom um, certificate extension. <clears throat> and if that signature is correct, and the signature of the CEA, say, is also correct, then we can trust the certificate. So that's very lightweight, right? You have the certificate as usual, and you have some additional information in this case, a public key and the witness value. And the public key and the witness, they're pretty small. Usually, it depends on the accumulator you use, but we're not talking about more than a few kilobytes. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a scheme. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening.
already a question. Yes. Um, so in my thesis, yeah, in my thesis, uh, the the set of CAs was not fixed. So CAs could basically vote in new CAs and exclude existing CAs if they wanted. And essentially, it was the majority of CAs decided over the other guys. That was the skewed assumption. Yes. Um, so in this, are you still, does this still rely on the CA doing the initial proof of identity? How do you confirm it? Yes, you do. So when you add a new identity, then you don't really have any additional security guarantees compared to the current system. Yes? Um, yes, so if I understand your, your question correctly, what happens if my certificate needs to be revoked? Or it has been revoked and I'm in the validation chain and I'm looking at, okay, I have the proof here that it has existed on the blockchain. Right, so, um, so if your certificate you know, is, is revoked, then you will need some separate revocation process in place or you will need to change your public key to invalidate that certificate. The yeah, you, yeah, you will catch a change if you update the public key on the blockchain. If you want to invalidate the certificates, another way you can do that as well, right? But yeah, if, if any of your, your keys leak, they, you will need to um, basically replace the key on the blockchain. Right. Yes? Uh, yeah, except that it was like two people that I had to defend against. Now it's, it's I don't know, a hundred, so, yeah. But I actually have a serious question. How do you know that you've got the most recent change? Right. Yes, so it's a good question, thank you. Um, so, uh, you can see that something looks, looks funky if there are blocks missing, because every block has a timestamp and there is a new block released, say, every 10 minutes. So if, if, you don't, um, if you don't, you know, if there are some blocks missing at the end, you can notice that. Um, however, um, if there is a man in the middle attack going on, there might be, the man in the middle will probably be able to drop, you know, some, some uh, blocks, maybe, and make the blockchain shorter, um, which can be a problem. Um, however, you will be able to detect it, um, since you know that should be a block released every, say, 10 minutes. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, you can. Um, it's like possible, and if your client accepts that, you can actually accept an old key. Um, that's that can be an issue, but you can also be strict and say that I need the last block to be timestamped during the last ten minutes. Otherwise, I would just drop the connection. Right. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And you have an update function for the witness. So do you need then a witness for this witness update function to prove that that is updated properly? Um, answer is no. Um, but no is the answer. You don't need a witness for the witness <laughs> update function. Um, the witness just proves that a certain, things, a certain thing was added to accumulator. And I just want to also point out that a part of the security requirement for an accumulator is that you know, any polynomial time adversary um, trying to create a witness for a non-existing 
for, for a value which has not been added to accumulate uh, will you know, succeed with negligible probability, right? What that means is that uh, this, this witness uh, over there and the public key then can be provided over an unsecure channel, right? There, there's no way that you can fake that witness value because, yeah, unless you have a quantum computer, maybe it depends on the accumulate use. Does that answer your question? Um, yes. So uh, this same disclaimer as my uh, as the previous question. So I'm not sure I understand everything, but the key question here: How do you uh, solve the uh, when you have a issuing a, 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 a blockchain, a, a certification authority uh, publish a uh, certificate using the a known uh, CA certificate, right? Um. Um, yeah, i not 100% sure. Let's we'll see what happened. Yeah. This is a nice guy, but I go back one step. Um, I'm not 100% sure I understand your question. Um, so I will try to answer and see if something sticks. Uh, so basically, the certificate chain is, is like the same. It's, it has to be rooted in a in a CA, which is in your trust store, right? That's the same principle. Um, then the witness and the public key is just straight from the blockchain. So that's a separate trust anchor. Um, does it make sense? Um, to validate the certificate. Ah, when you validate the block headers, do you mean? Or... Right, and then you, yeah, then you will go to the trust store in your computer, Correct. and you will also check this, this end entity signature, Correct. but that's that's on the blockchain, right, directly. So there is no intermediary CA there involved. Um, you can, you know, you that's in parallel, yeah. Right, you have. You could think of a situation where you, you, you drop the CA, right, from the system, and they're just responsible for maintaining the blockchain. You could do that, but then you come to extend the validation and all these things, and... Um, if you leak your private key, you, you are in, in a, say, um, difficult situation. Um, if the certificate also needs to be attested to by CA, then you also need to trick the CA into accepting your new public key. So there's, the CA has a function here, which is important, I think. Yes? Yes, only an approved CA. And, and uh, how do you manage this with the signature of um, Yeah, so if you go back, I think I mentioned something about... Uh, it was a long time ago. Right, so... Um, you can enforce that each block must be co-signed by multiple certificate authorities. Right? Uh, that makes sure that the signatures in, in the transactions are correct. Um, so you can say that two-thirds of the CAs must sign together. Right? And it creates like a Schnorr signature or something, which is really compact. Um, is that the answer? That, yeah, good. Yes? Yeah, so 
good question. Um, I think this is a little bit more of a political problem, right? Uh, and also a technical one, but um, so I think in the end what the CEA wants to do, right? They want to ensure that they're not getting into trouble. <laughs> right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but and in this system, you just have more checks in place to ensure that you're not getting into trouble. And in the end, I think that should be some kind of um, motivation for the CAs. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't answer your question fully, but I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, OK, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I got my opinion, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it looks like everyone is exhausted, so <laughs> thank you. Yeah.